Welcome everyone. So thank you for uh, the initial presentation and setting me up for uh, my talk, talking about SDK development. And first of all, SDK development, when, when I got started with it, it's kind of hard. So this is supposed to illustrate is, uh, I was stranded in a desert looking, looking for water, looking for how to actually be able to be successful and reach my, uh, my, different, uh, my different objectives for developing our SDKs. So before I start, uh, start getting into uh, the meat of my session, my name is Ja. Uh, my French is terrible, so I'll obviously do the talk in, uh, in English. And I'm a developer advocate of Ludwig. So my talk will also be about uh, my experience uh, developing SDKs on top of uh, on top of our API. So what I'll cover is uh, what kind of API do we actually have, and what are we what are we building on top of, what were our initial goals, what kind of challenges did we run into, and what did we learn from this uh, from this experience of going through the entire process. And uh, at the end. Probably won't have a lot of time for Q&A, but I'll be hanging out in this room for most of the day, so feel free to uh, hit me up. Uh, my Twitter is also on there. So. so, first of all, our API. So, as Rubik, we're a, we're a cloud and data management company. We do backup and restore and different uh, data management uh, technologies. But our SDKs are mostly focused on our uh, on our backup and restore options. So there's a couple of a couple of use cases. So uh, we have uh, cloud data management, like DR scenarios, uh, test and development scenarios. If you want to use your backup data to uh, to spin up some additional instances of a production workload, and even uh, CI/CD integration. So the challenge we, we have here is backup is traditionally uh, not, not a very innovative space. So there's a lot of legacy tooling out there. Uh, there's uh, custom, custom tools or modules and basically a lot of GUIs. And GUIs can be nice, but it, it can be better. So what we have and what, what I was working with was uh, we have a product that's based uh, is is uh, API first uh, is developed uh, with an API first approach. So we have an API for everything. So anything you would do in the GUI or even things you cannot do in the GUI is available as an API. The the bad side is some of these in, uh, endpoints are classified as internal endpoints. So. That, that's not a great development uh, experience. But we do use the open API stack and it makes it, uh, makes it easy to, uh, to find out what kind, of, uh, what kind of endpoints are available and uh, to do version from version uh, comparison. So now that we set down uh, the groundwork, let's take a look at what our goals are, what we, we were trying to achieve when we started building out these SDKs. So we want to simplify the API interaction because uh, using uh, using the API endpoints directly, we're working with a lot of JSON payloads, receiving and sending them the different uh, the different web uh, web methods. And with the SDKs, we we wanted to target a different kind of users. So we don't. Uh, we don't just want to target developers, but we also want to uh, target uh, administrators, for example, that otherwise would not consume APIs directly. So, uh, in order to provide that, uh, we want to have structured output. So, uh, our APIs give JSON output, but we want to be able to use that in a, in a more automated and more intuitive way. So we don't want to be making any, any direct API calls anymore because if there's going to be any changes to, uh, to our APIs or to our endpoints, we want to abstract that away from our, uh, from our end users. We just want to provide them with the functions in, in the different SDKs 
so they can just consume uh, uh, consume the resources without having to worry about if the endpoint is going to change or if there's going to be a different status code. We we want to abstract that away. Uh, another another thing is we want to have session management because if you want to want to be connecting to multiple clusters, we don't want to be, want to be authenticate every time, and we also want to provide the ability to. Uh, be able to be connected to multiple instances at the same time. So, getting into the interactive use, uh, we currently support three different languages. So, we have uh, Python, PowerShell, and Go. And in the next example, I'll go over uh, the differences in the experience of interactively using, uh, using our API. So, if, for example, uh, we would be using Perl or we would be using any kind of uh, any kind of web request to directly query some information, we would end up with a result like this. So this is a simple, a simple query that returns uh, three objects, and you can see that's a whole lot of text, and it's not very easy. Uh, it's not very human readable. I mean, we can we can see the key value pairs, but this is not a fantastic experience. So in the next uh, in the next screenshot. I'll show what we've done uh, with our uh, with our PowerShell SDK. So we can see it's a lot easier to see what is going on. It's a simple command as well. We don't mention any of the endpoints, uh, but the data is still available. So because uh, because we just do a default display of what uh, of a couple of select properties. So if you want to have more information. Uh, or we want to know what kind of endpoints we're actually using, we can, uh, we can also uh, use it for both switch. When we use that, you can see, okay, it's hitting all these endpoints, we're doing these kind of queries, and we can use this in, in other tools, or we can even use this for discovery to, to be able to see, okay, if we want this information, we can hit these endpoints. Uh, another uh, another part of what uh, what we wanted to do, make sure of uh, we want to make sure that, that it was extensible. So whenever a new API endpoint is introduced, uh, we shouldn't have to rewrite our entire code base. So extensibility was uh, was very important for us. Another part of that is we want to build our tooling on top of uh, on top of our SDKs. So instead of uh, building uh, tooling integrations or use cases directly on top of the API. We want to make sure that uh, this all lands on our SDKs. And we can also extend our SDKs based on the requirements of the tools. So we get a bit of a feedback loop going on. We're developing a new tool. Uh, we end up getting new functions and uh, new users into our SDK. Some of our other goals were uh, to make sure that it's uh, open source. So we put our SDKs up on GitHub, uh, not just because it's nice to put it up on GitHub. It's also because I'm lazy, because I want other people to work on it instead of me. And uh, in order to provide that, uh, we made sure that we have a unit test to support this. So. Whenever a pull request comes in, we of course want to know that everything, nothing breaks and everyone, everything keeps working. And we want to have the documentation there so people know how to, how to actually use our SDK. So some of the challenges we ran into, because there's always challenges, especially when working on a diverse range of uh, products. Uh, one of the big ones was uh, team enablement. And when I say team enablement, uh, I just don't just mean our internal team, but also our, our team of contributors, and making sure that uh, that they are uh, that they are aware of how they can actually contribute and how to actually write unit tests. And uh, another part of this was. Uh, open source management, and when I say open source management, uh, it's kind of the community management, but also the aspect of, uh, of managing the issues, of managing the pull requests, and 
we looked at different methods of how we could actually automate this and how we can uh, how we can make this process easier for us. Because having to do code reviews uh, at the start uh, at the start of our uh, development cycle, we didn't have the unit test yet. So whenever code came in, we had to manually run the code to verify that a it didn't break anything and b it actually did what it was supposed to do. Uh, as part of developing uh, the SDKs, we had quite an extensive interaction with our different API endpoints. And because of that, it's, uh, we also spotted a lot of bugs in, well, a lot of bugs. We, we spotted bugs because there's always going to be bugs. I mean, when I write code, there's going to be bugs. I assume when you write code, occasionally there's a bug. Um, and that also puts us in a, in a unique position because uh, because we are using our API endpoint so much, we can uh, we can find these uh, these bugs and get the feedback back and actually improve our API based on uh, the development we've done on our uh, on our SDKs. And another thing uh, another thing we uh, worked on was making sure that uh, whenever there's a new API version. This gets translated into into the SDK. So this is also where uh, where the extensibility comes in. So whenever there's changes or new features or functionality, you can just integrate that uh, into our SDKs. Some of our uh, other challenges is if you're going to open source your SDK, how can you make sure that it's actually still secure? Obviously, you're going to be reviewing the reviewing the pull request, but if you have community contributions, you have to have some kind of framework to to ensure that there's no malicious code in there, that no one's skimming passwords or doing anything funky, uh, funky like that. Um, another challenge I found is if you're trying to automate everything, it can end up getting a bit messy. So one of the things that I've experimented with that didn't quite pan out the way I wanted to is uh, I thought it would be really neat to uh, make the change logs completely automated. But I found out that if you just base your, your change logs uh, on, uh, on the commit messages, commit messages are short, so it's not very descriptive. And I found out that automating everything was not, uh, not uh, the way to go. Another challenge was how are we going to handle the, the branching and the releases? Because we uh, we expose our product to our customers, and our customers they expect some level of support. So if uh, if you're just going to commit to master the whole time, just keep on adding new code, how do you how do your end users know which version is supposed to be stable, or when when it was a Friday night and you decided to do a bunch of coding without properly testing. So that's something we've, uh, we've worked on as well. So what we've learned from these challenges and going through the process, that early on when you're, uh, when you're architecting your SDK, when you're setting down, uh, setting down your guidelines, uh, make sure that there's going to be coding standards Make sure that you have proper contribution uh, contribution guidelines, so people know how they can contribute, what the minimum requirements are. So a very strong one for us was make sure that there's unit tests. Make sure that whenever you submit anything, you don't break the existing unit tests. And also making sure that our contributors, if they're not familiar with uh, uh, with the tools we're using. Just take a couple of minutes, either when they raise a pull request or when an issue is raised. Uh, set some time apart so you can actually edu educate them and make sure that they have the tools uh, uh, available to them so they can be successful and they can actually start contributing. One of, uh, one of the big, uh, big challenges I personally had was by putting it on GitHub, by making it open source, 
there were actually a lot more contributions and a lot more issues being raised than I initially expected. So the end result was that uh, uh, the, the timeline for the, for the project got shifted. So it's something to take into account and also make sure that whenever you start working on your SDK, that you, you set the scope and you set time aside to be able to to manage the community engagement, to be able to, to set some time apart to review the PRs or to identify the issues. Because the moment you start becoming more active, uh, developing more code, uh, pushing more uh, more out there, it's going to, uh, in, in our case, it, on some days we ended up getting uh, a pull request and like five issues raised. And that takes up a significant amount of time just to be able to research this and to triage if it's actually an issue or that we intended to have it this way. And lastly was uh, not to automate everything. So I already gave you an example with the change log. Uh, I tried to automate it. It didn't uh, pan out the way, uh, uh, the way I intended to. So not automating any, everything was uh, something that uh, worked out in our, uh, in our advantage. And with that, uh, I managed to get out of the desert, reach the oasis. We have a very, a very happy SDK uh, ecosystem of SDKs now. Uh, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be here.